Diana was looking at the set. She goes, oh, this is amazing. It looks incredible. She goes, it looks just like it did. You have to wow. tell your production designer he did a great job. And then she sort of started looking at the stairs and she said, I remember walking down those stairs and lots of roomy-eyed men looking me up and down and feeling like a piece of meat. Mm. I read the book first 15 years ago. Someone handed it to me actually after a, um, I was on a set for a short film acting in it and the sort of student short film. And I was just having this conversation about how curious I was about my own um, background and you know that how I had heard had grown up with my mother who I always felt looked to me like she was African-American but wasn't really saying that uh, she was American but she was living in the English countryside and you know she was a very enigmatic complicated figure and she would say things to me like you know it's maybe we're black I don't know and then I would ask her about it six weeks later and she'd go I just really don't know it's possible that it's Native American I just don't know it's very I had a very difficult childhood and then you know as I got older she would tell me instances of direct racist abuse towards her and her father and she would also tell me stories about how relatives of hers whose complexion were darker would would come in and visit after dark and be smuggled around the back of the house this was when she was three years old and then she never saw them again so it was it was yes no yes no and the thing that I was increasingly fascinated in was not it was not so much the sort of facts of the mystery, although of course the facts were compelling and I wanted to get to the bottom of them, but it was really, the thing that haunted me was, what is the toll on a child's psyche, on, on anyone's psyche, when you're brought up in an atmosphere of suppression, of like, don't behave like this, or this is, this is the kind of person you ought to be and we don't talk about this you know, basically secrets in a family and this being a kind of one that forms in some way your identity. And I thought, you know, if, if my, my mother's inherited that, then there are, there are things that I have inherited by being brought up by her from that. And what does that mean? What is the psychological toll of a life lived in hiding? And when I read the book, it gave me a historical context because I suddenly understood why the mystery what was happening I understood that my grandfather had at some point in his life made the decision to pass for white I also understood the psychological complexity of that choice the ramifications of that choice the book gave me that in a very real way because I think that ultimately the sort of the shocker about the book is that it's not actually about race it's about the negotiation of identity in whatever I mean it's looking at race as a construct a social construct which it is and it's also talking more broadly about how all of us form our identity under varying levels of oppression in a way you know we think this is who I want to be how much how do I know that I have complete freedom around who I want to be or how much have I internalized from society telling me what I ought to be you know, we, we all grapple with that. And we're looking at this in, in extremity. One woman who's obviously made the choice to put on a mask. And yet, in that choice, is quite free to be herself, ironically. And the other woman who's resolutely not decided to do that and is doing the right thing the, by, by, you know, proprietary social etiquette and everything else she's being the right kind of mother the right kind of wife the right kind of member of the black community the right kind of straight person and it's so rigid that she's actually busting out the sides of it I had worked with Rebecca a couple of times I was producing she was an actress and um then we produced something together where she also acted and I just basically annoyed her into giving me the script because I just felt that she was a filmmaker and she was somebody who should be directing movies. And I just badgered her uh, essentially until she said that she did have something that she wrote and that if she were to direct, this would be the only film that she wanted to be her first film. Um, and that she had put this script in a drawer after she adapted it. And, you know, she gave it to me and I read it and I was, and I hadn't read the book at that point. And I was just stunned by, you know, the adaptation, the subtlety, the beauty. It was exactly who Rebecca was as a filmmaker on the page. And 
uh, you know, we talked about how incredibly hard it would be to, to make a black and white four, three period drama with two black female leads. Um, and it was um, annoyingly difficult to, to get it to the screen. Um, and, uh, but I just knew, you know, I knew who Rebecca was and, and what she would do with this material. And I, she could have handed me anything and I would have made it. It was just pure luck and joy that she handed me something so beautiful. So yeah, we just went on this very long journey to get to this kind of exciting place where we're, you know, nominated for something so profoundly exciting. And, you know, it just feels very special and exciting. Well, I had originally adapted it um, for the stage. Uh, I'm mostly a theater director and I had directed it, um, you know, in a very small space. And it, it was really, I had a lot of questions for the Rustan play and it felt kind of small and intimate and personal to experiment with turning the, the poetry of the piece into songs um, with the um, Matt Berninger and Aaron and Bryce Dessner from the National. And uh, yeah, I never set out to <laughs> write a screenplay or to make a movie of it originally. It was um, Joe Wright saw the production that we did in a very small theater in Connecticut. And um, he wanted to make it into a film and asked me if I would write it. Yeah, it was an incredibly collaborative process. I had taken Rustan's play, which is really, really, really big and made it very, very small uh, with a cast of only 10. And I was really focusing on the love triangle between Christian and Roxanne and Cyrano mm -hmm. and kind of cutting a lot of the, the secondary plots in order to make space for the songs. And Joe, uh, and also I had made it a modern uh, retelling and Joe really wanted it to be Baroque and to return to the original mm. play and you know have kind of great big um, opening in the theater and then sort of slowly over the course of her stands five acts move to this this size and the intimacy of what I'd done on stage so basically the the final scene is pretty much as it was but then the beginning is a, a, a creation for the film our our musical is kind of weird because we didn't set out to make a traditional musical theater piece in any way and the play was actually through composed like a like a movie score and the songs don't function to forward the narrative they really are kind of mm. like poems they're windows into the characters souls and on stage they were almost like a full stop you know to the action while we stay with the character and, and they also aren't really kind of dance numbers they don't you can't do a kick line. So in, for the film, it was a, a joy to be able to um, layer in the narrative at the same time that we're staying still with the character's emotional life. Uh, so it was really different from the, the stage to the screen, the, the way that the music functions. There was a BBC Three documentary called Jamie Drag Queen at 16 that I saw in probably seven years ago now. Um, telling the story of Jamie Campbell, um, a 16-year-old kid from County Durham and his mom, Margaret. And in the document, I, I subsequently found out that actually um, researchers didn't find Jamie. Jamie sat home as a 15-year-old kid and went, I want to come out as a drag queen at prom. That's a bit scary for me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find a documentary maker to follow me. <laughs> um, so he wrote to several documentary makers and Firecracker and... Um, picked it up and uh, a director called Jenny Popwell kind of folded him around and made this documentary. And it's, it struck me as something so simple, but yet so beautiful. And it, it was a working class kid from a very working class community, um, but an openly gay kid, you know, that, that wasn't, he wasn't trying to come out at prom. He was so, he's a gay kid at school, but he was just wanting to come out as a, a drag queen at prom. And I was just inspired by the love of, and passion that his mom showed in supporting him. My intention really was to take Jamie's home, working class mm. c community, but then it, that, that could feel very real, very intimate. And it, both, I tried to do that both on stage and on screen. And then it was Jamie's imagination that actually flared into something bigger that could then 
take the scope of music and music and very very similarly you know I, with Cyrano I imagine the very similar thing it, where you get to that place that emotion takes over and you feel the necessity that you can then expand the imagination and take it into music and take it into song and that that's that's the power of of what music can do you know and, and as Dan would speak to it, music cuts through in a way that no, we all have music in our lives you know and it's continuing us and, and talks to our emotions very immediately you know and I also wanted to make sure that in our telling that the vernacular of that music was mm. pop, you know, um, because, you know, what we were creating is a, at that time a piece of musical theatre, but I wanted to make sure that the people in the, that working class council estate that we set it on, Parsons Cross in Sheffield, it, it felt like it was music that came out of their radio and spoke to them. So it, very deliberately, it's, it has a pop genre. The difficult thing about musical theatre generally is, is, is realising that, that you're asking the audience to go on this ridiculous jump into song right and so and and but luckily pop music is the kind of kitchen sink mm -hmm. and we did this this play which isn't particularly heightened it's it's very kitchen sink it's very day-to-day -day. they're very naturalistic in their performances and pop was the obvious place to go with that because um we felt like uh pop is the is the the language of the people and 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 so it was definitely going to be a pop score, and that's what I do anyway. So I found that easy. You know, I wasn't going to attempt to do something I don't know how to do. Um, but um, the, the 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 important thing I think is placement. Just making sure that the song is in the right place, and as in like it's earned its right to be there. It's you know you've you've got to do everything you possibly can to help the song survive the process <laughs> with musicals because it's so easy to cut them and it's so easy just to go into a straight play and not worry about doing the music bit and so a lot of my job is to kind of make sure that the song is doing everything it possibly can do it's not doing too much it's not repeating beats it's like it's got to survive somehow because you're asking an audience to go on a kind of slightly mm -hmm. ludicrous journey with you and that's part of that is is fighting for the moment. Really, I think most of our young people in the in the film had never done anything before. That included Max and Lauren, who plays Pretty. Wow. They'd never, you know, they they'd not acted professionally at mm. all. It was a massive journey for both of them. Both of them were both terrified, but you know, you had the first-time director is terrified as well. So we just held <laughs> each other's hands. Um, but also, then what? We particularly, our, our our first day of filming was actually in the sequence uh, that, that Richard, is in, Richard E. Grant is in, you know, where we go back into the 1980s. So I, my first day of filming was, was with 500 people Such in the crowd. Such a powerful sequence. And then my second day of filming was Max and Richard. So mm. this is Max's first, you know, essentially first proper full day on set. And Richard, a very experienced actor. And to actually that scene where they're in the uh, shop together, that was our second day of filming. And it was actually beautiful to watch because you watched what was happening in the story also happening in real life. Mm -hmm. Whereas, so you've got this innocent walking into this space going, I really don't know what I'm doing or how to do it and how can you help me? And then Richard going, okay, I'll take you under my wing and, and help you through this process in a not patronizing way, you know? So, he, so actually, I think what you kept, what we captured on film actually was reflective of, of the energy that was in those two actors as well. Uh, I always think there's something about nostalgia that's interesting is that nostalgia is like an affliction. And I think it's, it's weird. I used to find it strange that I used to be obs obsessed with the 60s, still obsessed with the 60s, but I was born in the 70s. And I'm like, why am I like pining for a decade that I wasn't in? And so, in a way, the film was sort of questioning that is like, and the idea of if you have these fantasies about being like a time traveler and being able to go back, you know, you can't kind of pick and choose what you do. Like, you can't be just a cultural time traveler. So, it was that thing of just sort of the idea of, um, you know, you, you can't have the good without the bad. And, and the idea that people, as they get further away, especially the people that weren't there, tend to romanticize the decade. So, all of those things were bubbling around as I made several after midnight walks in Soho. <laughs> and then also the sort of thriller and sort of psychological horror genre is one that I really enjoy and, and especially ones from that period. It was terrifying, but it was, it, Edgar had told us right from the outset that there was no point in making the film unless we actually did shoot in Soho. But it's always that thing that when you're developing and when you're trying to get a film off the ground, you don't have the resources to actually bring your crew on board who really need to put all the pieces in place to actually make it a reality. 
But everyone had always said to us, it's going to take a huge amount of time to really work out whether whether you can pull this off. Mm -hmm. So we went to our studio focus and said before the film was greenlit, look, the one thing we need to do is get a locations team on board really, really early. Mm -hmm. So we had Camilla Stevenson, our amazing um, location manager, and her team, and lots of our key members who had sort of been with us on the journey from you know, all our films and, and early in um, when, when Edgar was writing the scripts and knew about the project. Um, so we had a good sort of five months of really putting everything in place. I had had the idea for the film like 10 years ago and I'd it existed as like the story for a long time and it was in development, a first with film four. And I think during that time I'd sort of written the story and I, I hadn't got round to writing the screenplay and it existed as like sort of a campfire tale almost. <laughs> And one of the people that I told it to, bizarrely, before I'd even met the co-screenwriter, Christy wilson Cairns, is I had a meeting with Anya Taylor-Joy just after she did that film, The Witch, that was a Sundance in 2015. And I met her, and I was watching The Witch, and even though I hadn't written the script yet, I was thinking, she should be in my solo film. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that as I was watching the film. And then, and then I went to coffee with her, and I didn't plan to, but I told her the entire plot of the movie. And she was like, oh my God, I want to be in that film. So then the irony is, so then, then I felt like a bit like the boy who cried wolf over the next three years because I'd run into her every now and again, but I didn't have the screenplay. And then, it, then when we were writing the screenplay, the character of Sandy, who's the 60s counterpart, was sort of getting bigger, and it just occurred to me, maybe I was even looking at a photo of Anya in a magazine thinking, Anya should be playing the 60s bit. Like, I've seen, I've seen her play the other part. Let's put Anya... And so, I was then nervous sending her the script because I'd been telling her about this other part for three years and then said, hey, don't read that one, read like, you know, the other lead. And luckily she totally agreed. So it was an interesting thing because we'd had this person always sort of like loosely attached to it for a long time and then, and then she got offered the other part and went for it. And then we went looking for, you know, um, Eloise, which we found in Thomas and Mackenzie, which Naira was the first person to recommend Thomas and after... Uh, the film Leave No Trace. So, and then sometimes when you're writing, you're in the writing room and you think, you know who'd be great doing this? Diana Rigg. And you kind of say it out loud. <laughs> and the other person goes, oh my God, yeah. yeah. So you don't know whether you can get Diana Rigg, but those things get spoken aloud. So sometimes you're kind of like manifesting them. Especially with Diana Rigg and Rita Tushingham, like had their mm -hmm. perspectives on the script. And, you know, sometimes, and that was just, you know, it was obviously fascinating because they were there, and they're, they're not in the 60s sections. Yeah. But it was very strange things, like um, Dinah Rigg, uh, like, so there's a Café de Paris scene in the film, and she's not in that scene, but her, spoiler alert, her younger yeah. counterpart is. And we were rehearsing one day, and I happened to mention, because we had to build the Café de Paris as a set for various reasons, um, and I mentioned that the set was right there, and she said, oh, I... I went to the Café de Paris on my 18th birthday to see Shirley Bassey's first London gig. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. So, well, do you want to come and see the set? So I then, it's on a Saturday and it's always a bit magical walking through an empty soundstage, but like with Diana Rigg on your arm, going into the Café de Paris. And the thing is, I always notice when you talk to people who are actually there is there's sort of like the, the, the romantic remembrance and then there's that, that dot, dot, dot before maybe the kind of more sort of real answer. And Diana was looking at the set. She goes, oh, this is amazing. It looks incredible. She goes, it looks just like it did. You have to wow. tell your production designer he did a great job. And then she sort of started looking at the stairs, and she said, I remember walking down those stairs and lots of roomy-eyed men looking me up and down and feeling like a piece of meat. Mm -hmm. And it was just... And it, I, like, you know, kind of left and sort of was all the way home just thinking... I don't think she was even relating it to the script, yeah. but that was her experience. And, and Rita as well would like sort of, you know, would talk about kind of things that happened to her or friends of hers. Um, Terence is a bit more kind of inscrutable. Like Terence is sort of like, I felt after a certain while that he'd talk about everything except 60s London. <laughs> I'd noticed that all of the stories were about Pasolini and Fellini. And I'm thinking, you never told me a single London story. But the one thing that he did though, which was really strange, is that he's in a pub scene in the Toucan. As he came onto the Toucan set and he announced, uh, he said, I haven't been in a pub in 40 years. And then he got like a coaster out and he flipped it up in his hand. He goes, I haven't done that in 40 years either. <laughs> and I said, you've got to do that in the shop. Yeah. I said, you do that in the shop. And I gave him the light. I said, when you say this line, still got it, flip, catch. 
I said, you do that during a take, and I'll give you £10 every time you do it. <laughs> and by the end of the day, Terence Stamp had £100. <laughs> <laughs> my grandparents lived in Folkestone, like the next town down from Dover, and I spent my childhood on those cliffs. And when, when I knew that I wanted to make this film about this particular character uh, that's very personal to me, mm. There just seemed to be a, just a real natural, um, a real natural decision to set f the film between these two landscapes that are mirrors of one another, that are sisters in a way, that share this kind of body of water, have this kind of long history, and it, it's it's the kind of sonic experience in those locations as well. Like mm -hmm. as a kid, like I'm from quite a large family. There's uh, eight of us. And so we didn't go abroad really for holidays. We would go to Great Yarmouth or would go to Dover or Calais. And so there was something about, they're very distinct places, but they share, I don't know, there's something about it. I think it's, it's connection to the, to the channel mm -hmm. and the cliffs and, and the soundscape and the, the winds and the birds and this kind of underlying mechanical heartbeat, because there's fairies obviously going back and forth like constantly. And that kind of, um, that sound of the ferry kind of feels like a kind of rumbling in the earth. It really permeates through everything. Mm. And yeah, I just, um, the, the landscapes just seem to reflect the, the characters um, and their, um, and what they kind of symbolize or represented in some way. And the film's about identity. It's about many things, but obviously it's looking at identity and that shifting, um, that erosion of ourselves and how we recalibrate, how we find new layers of ourselves and how as we move through life, we, we kind of discard our certain skins and new ones come to the front. And the image of the cliff was, was kind of there from the beginning. And I wanted that to be an important kind of visual motif in the film. And Lynn's writing had a lot of, has a lot of layers to it. I mean, we, we collaborated together on a, on a short film called Three Brothers before. Mm. Um, and I think what I learned from Aline on that already, which was again there for me in After Love, was something that I would call emotional displacement, was this kind of ability to tell a story where he managed to translate it, to kind of displace it so you could touch on it emotionally. Um, and I think this woman kind of has an internal journey that she goes through, mm. uh, which, which is kind of displaced in her grief. There's, there's a kind of grief underneath her grief. And it's very much to do with her own identity. So it was a very strong, yeah, proposition, I think. But obviously also something that came for Aline from a very, you know, personal understanding. The film isn't autobiographic yeah. in the sense that the plot, you know, the, the journey of this character yeah. is not from my life, yeah. um, thankfully. Um, but the character of Mary is very inspired by my mum and elements of her kind of earlier grief and, and loss are, are kind of from my family. But it's an interesting question about kind of truth, actually, because mm. what is the, that's very subjective truth and um, there is no absolute truth. And that is really what the film is dealing with in, some, in many ways, because the truth is dependent on the perspective and the film is looking at that, you know, how depending on what side of the channel you're standing on, what you see is, is not always what you, is not, do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's not, um, these women shared the same man. And uh, Mary, for example, lived her whole life with this character, with, with this man. Mm. Um, and it's commenting on how, how well we can really know the people closest to us. You know, they've had an over 40 year marriage. You would think that she knew the truth of this man, but actually, the film, in a way, is kind of looking at how we can not, we, we can never know the truth of anything fully. Mm. There is no absolute truth. In terms of like how I brought myself, I mean, this was the first film that I'd written, and so I think one of the beautiful things about working in this medium, film is a medium that is concerned with time and memory, and as a filmmaker, I get to explore my fears and desires. Um, and rearrange them uh, through my work. 
but also uh, it's autobiographic in some ways, but not in, I mean, yes, my mum is a white Muslim convert, but I feel like the parts of me that are in the film are not so easily mm -hmm. kind of um, identifiable. And I think that's what I like about being a filmmaker is that you can kind of reveal yourself without revealing yeah. yourself fully. It came out of lockdown. It came out of that extraordinary period where we were all quiet mm. and, you know, he had a moment to reflect and think of his childhood. Like I think a lot of people did, you know, you looked about, you know, what became important to you and what your family and family became important and that it grew from that. And then I read it and I just went, we have to make this and we have to make it like now. It was a big responsibility mm. to, to do something set in Belfast and to recreate that and especially over that time. So we got an awful lot of mm. advice from people of friends and family over in Northern Ireland, and plus uh, Northern Ireland Screen were a massive help. You know, we had to do things like to find out the buses. We did a sort of a, got somebody on sort of Facebook to write about what numbers were the buses and what colours they were and things like that, mm. which was, you know, it was good fun. I liked all of that <laughs> bit. We were very lucky coming yeah. straight out of uh, the first lockdown, isn't that people were available. <laughs> so, you know, we wouldn't, if we weren't, we probably wouldn't have got, you know, Jamie and Katrina and mm. Judy and thing, but they were available. It wasn't just, we wanted the right people, not to say that, but it was just very lucky that we got named people available. Mm. Um, with Jude, the young, the young yeah. boy was the key. Buddy, casting of Buddy was absolutely, mm. uh, we weren't going to make the film until we found Buddy. And, uh, and we did, our casting department did an amazing job. Um, Cara Strange over in, uh, Strong over in uh, Belfast put together 300 kids. I mean, they have an extraordinary resource over there um, now in Belfast. And, you know, they all did their little safe self tapes. And we just kept honing it and honing it down. And um, we got to sort of the last sort of six kids and we, interviewed all the parents as well to get a sense of them because they're such yes. a vital part of the whole thing and what was interesting about um jude as we were talking about the filming process and what it's like and you know said it's long hours you know you get up early and then you might you know not be used and then you, you have to come back and do it again and then you have to do this and uh, mum, well, 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 he does Irish dancing. You know, this is what you know. This is what he does. So we travel all the way over Ireland, and he gets there. He puts his outfit on. He might do one dance, and then he comes off again. And then if he's done well, he d he does it again. And you went, God, he's had the most perfect training. <laughs> wow. And and it was. And he came, and he knew, and he worked hard, and we were blessed. The things that I love about her work is that it's so rooted it's really rooted in a place mm. and people and I um love the fact that it's a very it's really organic in that it's a sort of germ of an idea and then it might be sort of she might be thinking of three different films and then at one point I'll go are those two like the same film and then we go off on that track and so there's a lot of there's a um there's a lot of exploration and there's a real sort of um there's you know, I find it really creative to be involved in that so I'm very mm -hmm. involved in in that part of it and um it's it's a really rewarding way to work so we and we're so involved and so invested in the projects they they are almost like children with um you know the two the arbor and the selfish giant we had worked with the white working class community and got to know really those people on the estates, Homewood and Buttershaw. And in Ali and Ava, we had the privilege of getting to know Murray Hassan, who Murray, who is Ali, is based on uh, Murray Hassan, who has a, he's an actor, but also a landlord and an ex-DJ. He has a cameo in the Arbour. Well, no, he has a scene in the Arbour. And he plays the, if you've seen uh, Ali and Ava, he's got a little cameo mm -hmm. in there. Um, so we had the privilege of, of kind of getting to know um, where he lived, his community, where we Ali's house in the film is Murray's house. 
um, the house next door, which is Ali's mum's house, is also Moe's brother's house. And then the tenants in the film are actually Moe's tenants. They're non-actors, but they're Slova his Slovakian tenants. <laughs> and Clio, as part of her process, went to talk to Moe and recorded interviews with him and... Um, and then said, "Can I meet? Could I? Could I go and see meet some of your tenants?" And she was in that, in the in the um, in the house. And uh, she phoned me up, and she was like, "I really want to film in here. I don't want to recreate this. I really want to film in this space, in these spaces." And also, Ava's house is another one of Moe's properties. He's quite a successful landlord, <laughs> <laughs> but lovely, lovely, very generous man who also helped us behind the scenes and also helped us with the dialect. And I got to learn so much about um, Pakistan and the Mirpuri community, and I didn't, I knew, you know, some of it. So that sort of opened my eyes to that community, and so that that was that was really wonderful. And I think Clio especially feels a huge responsibility for for telling Moe's story. Uh, Adil um, had actually contacted Clio um, when we and, and they met at the Toronto Film Festival, and they ha had a had a few drinks and um, just got, got on so well and there was this connection there and, and so Clio had, they were like, okay, what, you know, they sort of thought about this idea and Clio was like, I'm thinking of this idea and she really wanted to do a love story. So that was one, that was, I think, we've never started before with a, a, a genre, yeah. if you will. So um, that, that was interesting. Still wanted to set it in Bradford um, and then a deal was sort of, came into that and he listened to um, transcripts from Moe and they built that character together. Um, and then with Claire, we had a very short short list for actresses and um, they, uh, you know, Claire was, you know, it's, it's quite brave coming in when you know that the other person's been cast. Um, but it was brilliant and um, when we, we found her, and I should also say that um, Ava's based on this amazing, incredible woman called Rio that we're so very close to. Um, and then with other cast, we Sean he is in The Selfish Giant and he plays Callum, the, the son, in this film. And, um, you know, we were keen to sort of forge these relationships um, again. And Natalie Gavin is a recurring cast member. And we had the amazing Shaheen Baig mm. on board to sort of... Um, casting director. Yeah, yeah, casting director. Really wonderful. And then we did we did open castings in Bradford. And so a lot of the kids that you see dancing around and dancing on the, you know, dancing on the in the car scene. And um, we did open castings. And, I mean, I do love open castings because you just, there's so much energy and you just see all this talent. And it, and it, and it is so, it's so brilliant. And having non-actors is scary, but it's, um, there's also sort of such a sort of... In, it invigorates things as well because you don't always know, <laughs> know what you're going to get. But yeah, I'd worked in kitchens for many, 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 many years um, as a chef. And that was my, that was what it was like, mm. you know. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just bring the truth to it and, and, you know, and sort of do something a bit different that you wouldn't necessarily, you haven't seen before in terms of like that, that world, you know, I've seen films made in that space before, and for me personally, the, what I've experienced and witnessed, it wasn't, they didn't quite hit the mark, um, mm. and I wanted to have a true representation of it as well as true as I could possibly give, really. Phil and I initially, when we right after the short, we uh, we started discussing what, you know, how would we going to do the feature? What's it going to be? And you know, I went through many different lives. At one point, it was all set on an oil rig. Um, and then at one point it was a vineyard of certain, like an anthology in a hotel, wasn't it? At one point, yeah, and then yeah, we yeah. settled back onto the one take thing. Let's do it just like the short and basically uh, remake the short as a feature, basically yeah. the same. And there's elements of the of the story in the feature that are also in the short. But and you know, in, uh, from a production point of view, initially you go, okay, well, you know, we manage that. Let's do it again. But it's a whole different world when you're doing a feature film and logistically. Everything changes. Everything, mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, we use the sound as a uh, as an example of that. Is we had to have two sound recorders because we were using so many so many channels. Uh, we had to, uh, we had about thirty eight characters that actors had to be radio mics. Then we had an additional thing like a, well, we had thirty two actors and like six plant mics as well. Mm -hmm. We had to get special permission from Ofcom because we were interfering with airplanes and police radios because <laughs> we were using so many audio channels. 
uh, and that in itself was, an, you know, was a, an incredible, incredibly difficult technical feat to do. Those problems present themselves almost too late. You've already made, you've already committed to that, to that process. So you're like, oh, okay, we've got to figure this out. I was going to say, there's one really good thing. I mean, we're we're all really good friends as well, and I think it was so important to create. We were at the beginning of it. But... <laughs> well, we were. <laughs> we hate each other now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, to create an atmosphere on on the set where everyone knew that because it's you know if you get your your lines or something wrong really wrong halfway through what happens next? So to create the atmosphere on set to make sure that everyone felt so supported and so encouraged mm -hmm. to be able to make mistakes, but it's okay because that's part of the what actually happens. I was listening to Stephen um, speak last night, Stephen Graham, and uh, he was saying you know. You do drop things when you're at having dinner or you're doing whatever. You do, you make mistakes all the time. So to actually incorporate that, but for actors and some of the actors were quite young to actually let them know that it's okay to do to you are so supported. No one's going to look at you and be like you've done something wrong. Or so we had to really create get everything really well prepared in advance so that people felt that they were able to really cut their teeth in a safe environment. And so I wanted the actors to during the workshops and the rehearsals, I wanted them to sort of come, it wanted it to come alive from them really as well. So then we, we would write the things that they were saying in the script and then they, we had, that was the next version of the script. <clears throat> but even when we come to shoot it, I'd said to all the actors, you know, don't feel like pressured and, and sort of tied down to that specific yeah. dialogue. I want you to be, just listen to each other because it's incredibly important to just listen. And that's, that's what acting is really. Mm. Is listening and, and reacting. Stephen is the master. Oh God, the yeah. Master you've got to be on top that. of your game. Like, yeah. you've got to be on top of your game because he would change little things and not internally. He, he had to do the 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 move. So mm. any movement he had to make was had to be that was set. But in terms of what he was saying and things like that and how he was saying it, it was you know not different every time, but it was tweaked. So you know, actors need to be ready for that. Mm. And then we did a. Some, some auditions with them where they didn't have the script, they just had um, the character, they knew what character they were coming in for. And we had another actor, Robbie O'Neill, who's, who's also in the film, he's a great friend of mine. <clears throat> he, um, I would just say to him, right, when they come in, I'll just say, I'd say to the actors, right, you're late for work, there's some props, just um, come in and, uh, in, in character. And then uh, I'd send Robbie in and be like, I want you to just go and you know, <laughs> give them hell sort of thing. <laughs> And some of the actors would be like, oh, sorry, 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 can we, can we, can we do that again? I wasn't expecting that. I was like, I know you weren't. <laughs> That's the point. Um, to just see whether people could, you know, react in the moment. Um, yeah. Carolyn McLeod was our um, uh, casting director. And she found, I mean, we saw so many tapes, so many tapes. She had hundreds and hundreds of people wanting that to do That was Christmas 2019. Yeah, we all sat yeah. there just watching tapes and tapes, but it was, yeah. So, and some people were just absolutely outright brilliant from the first tape you, time you saw them. You're like, amazing. Um, yeah. I think it was, um, it was Gala Botero who plays uh, Maria, the, uh, the, the dishwasher, and she, she was, uh, when we saw her, it was scary. Her, her tape, we, I think we said, that's it. She came into the audition and I was like, and... <laughs> She basically, I did exactly that. I was like, Robbie came in and, and then she just went to town on Robbie. In Spanish. <laughs> and in, but in Spanish, and I was like, I was, I was, I was scared. I was like, oh my God. She went out the room and was like, she's got the job. Like she's, I feel like if I don't give her the job, she's going to come back and kill me. 